I'm Stephen Bentonoon with the New Institute of Biblical Research, and it is a pleasure to get to come and speak with my friends, both Jews and Gentiles alike. Uh, if you have your Bible and you would like to turn to 2 Chronicles, uh, we'll be looking mainly at chapter 20, uh, but I do want to recap a little bit from chapters 18 and 19 of the relationship that uh, King Jehoshaphat over Judah had with uh, King Ahab, who was over the house of Israel. And you may find the title of this message rather strange. Uh, I have titled the message, uh, The Time of Israel's Deliverance Revealed. Uh, I'm not setting dates when I say that, but what I want to show you is how laying right here in the Word of God is prophetically speaking of the future of Israel and the events that would transpire. And for my Jewish brethren, I ask you to pay, pay, pay very close attention yourselves uh, because you will actually find in this message here um, a lot of interesting insight of the deliverance of our own people and the timing and how it actually is laying in the story of Jehoshaphat, the things that are happening currently in Israel, uh, uh, the, with the nations as well, everything right here in Jehoshaphat's life. Now, the, in the recapping here, Jehoshaphat, as we know, was a godly king. He followed in the footsteps of his father, and uh, he, he, you know, he 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 believed God with all of his heart. He took out the groves, uh, he took out the high places, and. God was pleased with him because he had a desire to serve God with his entire heart. Um, and Ahab, of course, had done just the opposite. Ahab, uh, he had married Jezebel. He brought idolatry into Israel. Uh, they had their own prophets. In fact, Jezebel had 400 of her own, which I mentioned to you not long ago, how that Esau and Jacob, and when Esau come uh, to, 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 to meet uh, Jacob, he came armed with 400 men. Uh, just like uh, uh, Ahab, uh, his wife's prophets, Jezebel, that ate at her table, she had 400 prophets. It's kind of interesting because, as I mentioned to you in many other messages, that uh, the Mount of Esau in modern days is in Rome. It is in Rome, Italy, because clearly the descendants of Esau, even in the rabbinical teachings, that Esau's descendants ended up in northern Africa as well as in uh, Italy or Rome at the uh, for modern days. It is also a biblical fact because clearly Hadad, who escapes uh, David's sword, who is a royal line of Esau, goes into Egypt. He is raised in all the ways of Egypt, just as Moses was raised the same way. But Moses forsook the ways of Egypt and the wisdom and knowledge of Egypt and embraced the, uh, the God of Israel and became the deliverer of Israel. Hadad, on the other hand, uh, learned all the ways of Egypt and then took them into Syria, became the king of Syria, and then eventually his descendants migrated up into Rome, taking the pagan traditions of Egypt with them, the worship of the sun and the moon, uh, the, the ideology of Pharaoh being God on earth, and they set up in, in latter days uh, as a, a supposed offshoot of Christianity, uh, the Roman Catholic Church and made the Pope a vicar on earth. But in everything they do and everything that we see, they are clearly uh, part of the Egyptian uh, traditions that happen in Egypt. Uh, we see this also in the creation of the Muslim religion, which was created by the Catholic Church. Uh, that's very evident as well. Uh, the, the Muslim women, they dress just like a nun does. They, they use rosaries just like the Catholic people do. Uh, so therefore, it's very obvious in many other things, uh, the worship of the sun and the moon, uh, the Muslims uh, acknowledge the fact that they have the moon over their, their, uh, their mosque, uh, which represents the moon god. Uh, so not getting into that at this point here, but uh, the point is, is that Ahab marries Jezebel. Jezebel brings idolatry into Israel, and of course, Israel eventually falls. The house of Israel falls as a result of the alliance that Ahab has with his wife Jezebel. Now, in modern days, we have Shimon Perez, who is a type or a son of Ahab, who has done the exact same thing, repeated history in Israel, and has brought uh, Jezebel, in this case, the Roman Catholic Church, back into Israel, marrying uh, the Catholic Church to the Jewish people. Um, now, I, that's just something I want you to keep in your mind, because as you look at this from a prophetic standpoint, you will see everything play out. Now, Benjamin Netanyahu at this time, Prime Minister of Israel, is also clearly 
uh, seems to be very much like Jehoshaphat. Now, I know there's a lot of people who would disagree with that. You would say, no, uh, he is an Illuminati. He's, he's this, he's that. Um, you know, I'll let God judge that part, but let me just say this here. Uh, it seems that when you watch uh, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, he does have a heart for his people. He has a heart for Israel, but the problem is, is uh, he is fearful of the nations. Jehoshaphat also was fearful of the nations. But he's constantly quoting the word of God. The only problem is, is he hasn't taken down the high places, nor the groves, nor the altars uh, of Baal that are all throughout Jerusalem. So he's a little bit behind the eight ball in that regard there. Uh, that's maybe a bad choice of words, but in other words, he's, he's behind the, the, the course, I should say. Um, but the point that I want to make here, though, is with uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, is that he, he's... Um, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is much like Jehoshaphat. Uh, he, he hasn't taken down the altars, though, and he hasn't taken down the, the, the groves of, uh, to Baal to where they burn incense and stuff. So he is behind time as far as the way Jehoshaphat was. But there's a lot of similarities there. And one of the most important similarities is that he has aligned himself with King Ahab, in this case here in modern days, with Shimon Perez. Uh, Shimon Perez has already made the, the Vatican, the covenant with the Vatican. He's married into Jezebel. And Jehoshaphat, trying to bring unity uh, between uh, Judah and between the house of Israel, tries to bring unity when Ahab, he goes to visit Ahab, and Ahab says, you know, make an alliance with me and fight my enemies w with me. Uh, well, Prime Minister Netanyahu has done very much the same with uh, Shimon Perez. He has therefore gone to Jezebel's descendants, uh, which is the Roman Catholic Church. He has, is mingled in amongst them, and God actually held that against Jehoshaphat that he did that. He was angry with Jehoshaphat for doing that, just as God is not pleased with the prime minister for making any kind of covenant with Jezebel and her, and her family there in Rome. Now, we know according to the... Uh, there, there comes a time when, when, when they're there and they're making this alliance uh, uh, and, and Jehoshaphat being the godly man says, have you consulted the prophet? Uh, you know, have you consulted the prophet of the Lord yet or consulted the Lord? And he said, there'd be a prophet among you. And, and of course, Ahab says, yes, I have 400 already. Uh, again, might I mind you, the 400 that that uh, that Ahab has is he doesn't consult. There's, there's two different groups that they have. 450 is one that... Israel has, but Jezebel has 400 of her own. And so the prophets that he consults are Ahab's prophets that eat at her table because it clearly identifies the 400, not the 450, uh, which is kind of interesting. And they come and they prophesy only good into King Ahab with one mind and one accord. Today, uh, the Vatican also has their own 400 prophets, which are the different evangelical leaders around the world that have joined in with the Catholic Church. Uh, they are basically the voices for the Catholic Church prophesying all the goods that are going to come. They are showing that the, that the Vatican is good and that the evil ones are the Muslims and that they're going to get victory over uh, ISIS and all these groups out here. This is their prophecy uh, unto Israel. It's their prophecy unto to Netanyahu. And so as we're watching the world stage play out, we're seeing the, the, the battle that uh, between Shimon Perez and Prime Minister Netanyahu, as they have clearly made an alliance with Jezebel, uh, to go against this Arabic forces that are against them, the Syrians, uh, in fact, is what it was. The Syrians, just like it is today, ISIS is in Syria. They're going out there. The, the European Union, the United States, all of them, they've made a coalition. Of course, the Pope is the head of all of this in the first place. All you have to do is go into the European, the revived Roman Empire today. You will see every single European state has a statue, an image unto the beast, we might say, which is a, a statue of the Pope of some sort in every one of these countries here, if not multiple ones. It's very interesting to see that in itself. Uh, so the Pope is exalted as God on earth, not to mention he admits that already in his own uh, writings and beliefs, that they believe that he is a replacement or the vicar of Christ. So therefore, he's just like the Pharaoh of Egypt. Uh, so Ahab has made this alliance already with Jezebel. 
this day today, Shimon Peres, uh, and Jehoshaphat, or in this case, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, trying to do what he thinks might be best for, for the House of Judah. Keep that in mind as well, because the House of Judah is the only ones that are back in Israel today. The House of Israel has not come home as of yet. Uh, so they're making this alliance and hoping to stomp out the Arabic problem, the Syrian problem at that time, which today is the ISIS problem in Syria. Uh, it's not going to work. And in fact, uh, Ahab goes into battle, Jehoshaphat goes into battle with him, and uh, Ahab disguises himself in hoping that the Syrians would not recognize him. Well, he falls in battle. And not only that, but Jehoshaphat is pursued relentlessly. And in his plea unto God, God ends up delivering Jehoshaphat from the enemy and he makes it back uh, to Jerusalem to dwell in peace. But Ahab dies. Now that's something I thought was interesting. I won't, I won't elaborate on that, but I'll just say I think that's interesting that Ahab actually dies in the process of this battle. So, interesting to say the least. Um, and that we find that in chapter 19, it says in verse 1, And Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem. And Jehu, the son of Hananiah, the seer, which is a prophet, a seer, he's a, he's a prophet, um, went out to meet him and said to the king Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Now, mind you, Prime Minister Netanyahu, the same words apply to you today. I know that's difficult for me to even say this to you, but you must hear this and you must understand. The wrath of God is against you because you have made an alliance with Rome. God never intended for you to make this alliance, but you did it anyway. So, the seer comes and tells him this. He says, you should have helped the ungodly, you, you, you know, you, you help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord. And it's true. Do you think the Vatican loves the God of Israel? Hashem, the name that we're waiting to be restored, which by the way, will be restored during this time when the enemies of Israel come against us. It's one of the reasons why we'll be able to sing the song of victory according to Moses in Exodus chapter 15. I will sing unto the Lord that we have gotten victory over the horse and over his rider, the Susbeir of Kevet. See, God is going to bring his word to pass. Now, so he says, nevertheless, there are good things found in thee in that thou hast taken away the groves out of the land and hast prepared thine heart to seek God. So even that is a prophetic thing that Prime Minister Netanyahu, you will end up having to do. You will remove the groves from Israel and then you will set your heart to seek God. That seems to be clearly a prophecy about yourself. And Jehoshaphat dwelt in Jerusalem, and he went out again through the people from Beersheba to Mount Ephraim, and brought them back unto the Lord God of their fathers. Wow, now there, you want to look at Malachi 4, where the Christian context believes that Malachi uh, 4, part of that applied to John the Baptist, returning the heart of the children unto uh, excuse me, on the heart of the fathers unto the children, turning the heart of the children of the fathers unto the children. And of course, the, the, who are the fathers? The fathers have always been, according to Jewish belief, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's written clearly in the Torah, the Tanakh. It's written everywhere in our word that the fathers are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Okay, these are the fathers of our faith. And if God is going to turn the heart of the fathers unto the children, then what was their heart? Their heart was to see the seed of God. Because they said, thy seed shall possess the gates of his enemy. What seed? What seed? The seed was the Mashiach, the woman's seed. The promise of the coming of the Messiah. So what was their heart? Their heart was to see the Messiah. And the Messiah, their heart, the Messiah, Mashiach, was turned to the children. 
And he possessed the gate of his enemies. Which was what? The gates of hell. He possessed it. Because death, hell, and could not hold him in the grave. But nevertheless, their heart's desire was to turn to the children, but the children didn't receive it. Not yet. Now, according to Malachi 4, the second half of the verse, which is just like Isaiah 60 and uh, 61, Yeshua reads half that verse, not the second half. Why? Because it applies to his second coming. Now, that's for the Christians that understand that God can take half a verse and apply it to one season and 2,000 years later can apply it to another season. Is that not true? So you can't say that, oh, you're going to read every single verse. Well, in some cases, you do need to read more than one verse, but also it can be half a verse as well that applies. So is Malachi 4. It applies to the heart of the children shall be turned to the fathers. What children? The children of Israel, of course. It's a Jewish book written for Jews. So the Jewish hearts will be turned to the fathers, which their desire was for them to recognize Mashiach. So finally, the children of Israel recognize the Messiah. And according to Jehoshaphat, the king, when he finally tears down the groves, he begins to turn the children of Israel back to the fathers. Certain other words, what is he doing? He's getting Israel to seek for Mashiach. Just, it's, it's, remember, it is a type in Scripture that is a prophetic look at the future. All right, so. So Jehoshaphat dwelt at Jerusalem, and he went out again through the people from Beersheba to Mount Ephraim and brought them back unto the Lord God of their fathers. Now, he's not the one that turns the heart back, no, but he brings them back. Go back and look and search. He brings their heart back in one mind and one accord. Remember the story of David? David could not come back because he was waiting for the people to be in one mind and one accord. David types the Messiah. He's cursed. He, he, he cursed by his own son. His own child curses him. Yeshua comes to the children of Israel, they curse him. He leaves. He sits on the Mount of Olives and weeps over Jerusalem. David sat on the Mount of Olives, weeps over Jerusalem. Yeshua said, How often I would have hovered you as a hen with her own brood, but you would not. He said, Blessed are you. He said, Your house is left desolate until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now that's the way you have it written. It's actually, Blessed, he who comes in, blessed is your Savior who comes to you in the original. Hmm. Your house is left desolate. That's your human heart. It's left desolate. You should have received the Holy Ghost 2,000 years ago, but we didn't. We did not receive redemption because why? It was prophesied that we would offer up the sacrifice for the, the Messiah's sacrifice. And therefore, according to Daniel's prophecy, it would happen right before the destruction of the second temple, which clearly is written in the Talmud, that the Mashiach must come before the destruction of the second temple. Now, were the Talmudic uh, sages wrong or were they right in that? They were right. They were looking at Daniel's prophecy. They could clearly see it. So if we can clear, clearly see it, and I keep showing you prophecy after prophecy, why don't you look at the word? Okay, so now, Jehoshaphat begins to get godly even more so. And he said, judges in the land throughout all the fenced cities of Judah, city by city, and said to the judges, take heed, what you do, you judge not for man, but for the Lord, who is with you in the, in the judgment. Wherefore now, let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Take heed and do it, for there is no iniquity with the Lord our God, nor respect of persons, nor taking of gifts, or bribes is what the Hebrew word is. Israel's full of it already. Shame on you judges that claim to be judges of Israel. Shame on you. Look like Miss Levine. He's supposed to be the justice minister of Israel. You should be removed from your seat. You're not a justice minister. Oh, goodness. I could say a lot on that right there. Anyway, he sets all this up. Pleasing to the Lord. He wants to find favor with God. Now, we get into chapter 20. I jump forward a little bit here. And we read here in chapter 20, verse 1. And it came to pass after this that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon with them, some of the Ammonites, 
came against Jehoshaphat to battle. And that's kind of interesting because, you know, in the Christian Bible, it talks about all the nations would be gathered against Israel and to battle. It also says it in other prophecies and other parts of the Bible as well. The Tanakh is written as well that the nations will come against us to battle. Then there came some that, that told Jehoshaphat saying, there cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea, from Aram, and behold, they are Hazon Tamar, the same is in Gedi. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek unto the Lord. This is the way Israel is. We see all the nations gathered against us and do not think that Prime Minister Netanyahu is not very fearful. This is why he's so cautious. This is why he keeps making some of the mistakes that he makes. And some of the covenants, he's still got that alliance with Ahab. The only way he will change is when Ahab dies. Then he will realize God was not with him. I think you understand that, don't you? So, Joshua feared and set himself to seek unto the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah gathered themselves together to seek help of the Lord. And then why then does the military in Israel condemn the rabbis and the religious leaders that take and want to make it an army of God? Your whole, our whole nation throughout our history was an army of God. And now the leaders in the military want to condemn that. Even create a new word in Hebrew to be able to call it a, religious, a religiousization of the military. You need, a, you need an army of, uh, of, of people that stand for God. In fact, it'll be the one thing that brings you back to the God of Israel. And all of those that are against it, take them out of the positions. Put godly men and godly women in these places. Then you'll see the hand of God come upon Israel and find his favor. Give us women like Deborah. Give us prophetesses like Huldah. Give us kings like Jehoshaphat, like Josiah, like David. And get rid of these jellyfish that you have. I hear these spineless leaders trying to lead Israel. You don't know how to lead Israel. You need to find God first. And Prime Minister Netanyahu, if you are the prime minister at that time, or if it, God you raises up another one in your place because you will not do it, you will have to seek the Lord thy God with all of your heart and you will have to bring the people to do the same. And by the way, you'll find out that the Levites are involved in helping this as well. So we find in verse four, and Judah gathered themselves together to seek help of the Lord. This is Hashem. This is yod heh vav -Hey. Everywhere I say the word Lord, it is yod heh vav -Hey. Even out of the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. Hmm, it's interesting, huh? Judah and Samaria. And he said, O Lord, the God of our fathers, art not, excuse me, and Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. Let me read that to you in Hebrew just so you'll know. Be'yomed, Ve'yomed Yehoshaphat, be'kol Yehuda ve'yushalayim, be'bayet Adonai, lifnech chatzar ha'chodesh. Do you know this is telling you when Israel's deliverance is coming? Do you know that God is giving you a prophetic insight to when he will deliver Israel? Ahab will die. Undoubtedly, a covenant is broken, as Daniel prophesied. Because the king of Israel even turns to seeking God as well as the Levites. Ironically, they do this. Jehoshaphat stands in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord. Bayat Adonai. Hashem, Bayat Hashem. And he does it before the new court. Hmm. Excuse me. So, 
Regardless of who builds this temple, it still is a temple that will be recognized as the house of the Lord. And it will be a new temple when this happens. So deliverance for Israel will come after this temple is built. Then deliverance will come to Israel, which is kind of ironic because if you think about it, the death of the two witnesses, according to the Christian Bible in Revelation 11, this is when God also brings deliverance to Israel. So it's all lining up clearly. Let's look at that again. Let's look at that in Revelation. For my Jewish brethren that may not be aware of our, our uh, brother John, and I, I know there's all kinds of issues in the Christian Bible. I, I'm aware of them myself. Um, I have been studying and working on that along uh, as well. My wife, together, we are looking into a lot of these issues. That's one of the reasons why I like the Hebrew Matthew that was preserved by the Jewish people. Um, okay. These have power to shut heaven, and it rained not in the days of their prophecy, and have power of waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, and the beast that ascend out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And speaking about the two witnesses, chapter uh, Revelation 11, chapter 11, excuse me, and I'm um, starting at verse 6. Uh, and the dead, their dead bodies, he overcomes them, kills them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord, that's uh, speaking of Yeshua, was crucified, and they of the people in kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. Uh, and they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another uh, because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. Now that's also two people that do that custom, that is the Roman Catholics that do that, as well as the Arab people send gifts at the death of uh, their enemies. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither, and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted, and gave glory to the God of heaven. And the second woe is passed, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. Um, okay. It's not actually what I was looking for, but it gives you that part there. Anyway, so you understand the part about the two witnesses there. But there is another scripture, and maybe it's an Obadiah. I won't search for it now. It's not the right time. But it actually talks about when, oh yeah, I think it is Obadiah, where, where when the earth rejoices, uh, this is when there will be deliverance. And of course, in Revelation 11 is when the whole earth rejoices, is when the two witnesses are actually killed. Um, this is when the earth will rejoice. Let's see. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen as thou hast done. It shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. For as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink and they shall swallow down and they shall be as though they had not been. But uh, Mount Zion shall be deliverance and there shall be holiness. Uh, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. And the house of Jacob shall be a fire in the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for the stubble. Okay. Let me okay. Actually, it is in the book of Zephaniah, the prophet, in chapter 3, that identifies when the two witnesses are actually killed and also the deliverance of Israel. Now, if you go to chapter 3, verse 8, therefore wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, unto the day that I rise up to pray for de determinations to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them my indignation. Even all my fierce anger for all the earth shall be devoured with fire of my jealousy. Now keep this in mind because what we're looking at here in Chronicles in the, in the story of Jehoshaphat, uh, we saw a preliminary of this playing out in the story of uh, Jehoshaphat and Ahab. Uh, we see that in a preliminary. Uh, but now, Zephaniah is prophesying of the actual day that this will be fulfilled in its fullness. So verse 9, you see, he says, wait on the Lord uh, for this. And then he says in verse 9, for then will I turn the people a pure language, and they all shall uh, call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one accord. So this is when God's divine name will be uh, 
revealed to the people is when he returns that pure language into the people. All right, so verse 10, from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my su uh, suppliants, even the daughter of my disperse shall bring me bring mine offering. Now keep in mind also, when he returns that pure language, that's also uh, in, in agreement uh, with, uh, with, with, an, with another scripture as well. Um, hang on, that just slipped my mind for a second. Let me go ahead and finish reading this here. Uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. That, that brings me in the, in, in the prophecy of Moses, when God spoke to Moses, and, and Moses asked the question, Lord, they will ask me, what is your name? And the Lord says to him, I am that which I am. Uh, but he never reveals to Moses at that moment, what the name was, and neither did Israel ever ask Moses what is his name. What was what was Moses doing? Moses, unbeknown to himself probably, was prophesying of a future event when in the return of the two witnesses, Moses and Elijah, which is my own personal opinion on that, uh, he has to fulfill what he saw. Moses will actually, uh, the, the children of Israel will ask in this day, what is his name? Because the children of Israel don't know God's divine name, how to say it. It was lost because of uh, the rejection of Mashiach. It was lost because of this. During that time, and, and, the, and, the, and the, the Romans were killing the Jews who tried to pronounce it. They burned the rabbis at the stake for doing it. So therefore, that name was hid until now. And God says that he would restore pure language uh, at the time we see it around the time of the two witnesses, and that name will be restored. So Moses has to restore that name of the children of Israel because they will ask that question, what is his name? Mashimo. Okay, what is his name? Okay, so anyway, uh, verse 11, And that day shalt thou not be ashamed for all thy doings wherein thou hast transgressed against me. For then I take away out of the midst of thee them that rejoice in thy, in thy pride, and thou shalt no more be haughty because of my holy mountain. I will also leave in the midst of thee an, an afflicted and poor people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. The poor people will trust in him. The remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity, nor speak lies, neither shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth, for they shall feed and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. There again, you see the story of Jehoshaphat playing out. What does he do? He's getting Israel all back to one mind and one heart accord to serve the Lord. Single daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all thy heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord hath taken away thy judgments. He hath cast out thine enemy, the king of Israel, even the Lord is in the midst of thee. Thou shalt not see evil any more. In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear thou not, and to Zion, let not thine hand be slack. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save, he will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love and will joy over thee and with singing. I will gather them that are sorrowful for the solemn assembly, uh, who are of thee, to whom the reproach of it was burdened. Behold, at that time I will, I will uh, undo all the, that afflict thee. I will save her that halted and gather her that was driven out, and I will give them praise and fame in every land where they have been put to shame. At that time will I bring you again, even in the time that I uh, gather you, for I will make your name and praise among all the people of the earth, when I turn back your captivity before your eyes, saith the Lord. Um, now, it's interesting, it's still not the place I'm looking for, but as you can clearly see, everything that we're seeing even here in, in Zephaniah is, is, is clearly, it shows us the timing, uh, or shows us the story of Jehoshaphat. It's incredible. Um, mm, I did find it. All right, praise the Lord. Finally found the verse I'm looking for. Uh, it's Ezekiel chapter 35. Uh, again, another prophecy about the same thing that you're seeing in Jehoshaphat here. Uh, Ezekiel 35, 11, Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, I will even do according to thine anger and according to thy envy, which thou hast used out of thy hatred against them, and I will make myself known among them when I have judged thee. God makes himself known to Israel when he has made the judgment against who? Esau's descendants. You have to go back up and see. Because why? According to Ezekiel 35, they are planning to divide the land. They are planning to, uh, uh, to make it desolate. They, they, they want to make it into two nations. And yet, at the same time, Esau's descendants are wanting to take the land for themselves. We see this. Um, uh, uh, where is that at? Ezekiel 35. And that should be, therefore, I'll uh, back up just a little bit. Because thou hast had a perpetual hatred. This is in verse 
5, they shed blood of the children of Israel by force and the sword in the time of their calamity, in the time of their that their iniquity had an end, which is to, in the day that we're in now. This is the time when Israel's iniquity is to have an end, but yet they're still shedding the blood of the children of Israel. They still bring in all the terrorists. They're the ones that are inciting the Palestinians against the Jews. Um, and so therefore he says here in verse uh, 6, Therefore as I live, uh, saith the Lord God, I will prepare thee unto blood, and blood shall pursue thee. Sith thou, uh, sith thou hast not hated blood, even blood shall pursue thee. Uh, thus will I make Mount Seir most desolate. There again, Mount Seir. What is Joshua dealing with? He's got Mount Seir coming at him. And by the way, that is the Edomites uh, or Esau's descendants. Okay, so he says, um, uh, I'll, uh, back it up again. Uh, I'll make Mount Seir, verse 7, most desolate and cut off from it. Uh, him that passeth out and him that returneth. That is all the dignitaries that go in and out of the Vatican constantly in this day. And I will fill his mountains with his slain men and thy hills and thy valleys and all thy rivers shall they fall that are slain with the sword. Now you're going to see that, by the way, in the story of Jehoshaphat as well. I will make thee perpetual desolations and thy city shall not return and you shall know that I am the Lord. Now this is nice. He's not talking about Israel. He's talking about Mount Seir. He's talking about the Roman Catholic Church and, and all the nations that they bring with them against Israel. Okay, and watch what he says. Because thou has said, these two nations and these two countries shall be mine. What two nations? What two countries? And we will possess it whereas the Lord was there. The only place the Lord was, was Jerusalem. And they make it into two nations. Hmm. There was a sister that... Um, I'll go and have some other time. Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, I will even do according to thine anger and according to thy envy, which thou hast used out of thy hatred against them, and I will make myself known among them when I have judged thee. And thou shalt, excuse me, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord, and that I have heard all thy blasphemies, which thou hast spoken against the mountains of Israel, saying they are laid desolate, they are given us to consume. Now he says, you said it, the mountains heard it. You don't think the mountains don't have ears? God has said uh, in, in, in one place, I forget exactly where the scripture's at, but they're speaking, and, and the, the prophet says, the mountains, the rock here has heard the testimony and bears witness to the Lord. Incredible. Anyways, the mountains have heard it. Thus with your mouth you have boasted against me and multiplied your words against me. I have heard them. Now they think they're doing it against the Jews, just like all the other nations are doing. All that the Palestinians have a state. Israel's all a cruel people and everything. See, you're boasting against God is what you're doing. Not against Israel, against God. Thus saith the Lord God, when the whole earth rejoiceth, I will make thee desolate. There it is. All right, and when does the earth rejoice? According to Revelation 11, we find that the two witnesses are dead. That's when the earth will rejoice. But, anyway, all right, let's get back. Let's get back. Let's go back over here again. Uh, look at the story of Jehoshaphat uh, so you can finish seeing this unravel. Or our God without not. Uh, okay, so, as I said to you, the timing, of, we see this too, of this deliverance is there is a third temple already built. So it's obvious then that the two witnesses have come they're there during the time of the building of the temple, which is kind of interesting because the timing of the building of the second temple, there was two prophets as well back then. I know that Zechariah was one of them. I forget the, the, the actual prophet, the, the second prophet, but there were two prophets at that time uh, during the land, just like it, it will be in this time here where God will send the two witnesses. So that's kind of interesting in itself as well. Uh, and he said, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven, and rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen? In thy hand is there not power and might, so that none is able to withstand thee? Art thou not, uh, or excuse me, art, art not thou our God, who didst drive out the inhabitants of the land before thy people Israel, and gave us it to the seed of Abraham, thy friend, forever? Uh, and they dwelt therein and have built thee a sanctuary therein for thy name, saying, If when evil cometh upon us, as the sword judgment or pestilence or famine, we stand before this house and in thy presence, for thy name is in this house, and cry unto thee in our affliction, then thou wilt hear and help. Shows the name of God will be uh, uh, brought back to Israel during the time that this third temple is to be built. And again, it is a prophetic insight looking at that as well. Now, he's talking about if we were to pray like that, God would hear. Now, actually, that was Solomon's temple, not Hezekiah's temple. 
that was built during the time, uh, during right after the time of Jehoshaphat when the temple was still new. But they show that it still applied because it was built again on the Temple Mount. Um, and now behold, the children of Ammon and Moab and uh, Mount Seir, whom thou wouldest not let Israel invade, when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and destroyed them not. See, that's that covenant that got made there. Uh, behold, I say how they reward us to come to cast us out of thy possession, which thou hast given us to inherit. Again, look at the prophetic implications of today. The, the Roman Catholic Church is not the true Christian of today. Please, rabbis, don't make that mistake. They are Esau's descendants. They are part of the Syrians. Hadad, who was an Esau descendant, married amongst them, had children bound just like Esau did when he refused to go and get a daughter of, the, uh, of, 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 of his mother, Rebecca's family. Instead, he went and got them from, from, from the Arabic people instead. And so you see clearly that relationship is once again being established. Okay, when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and to destroy them not. Behold, I, I say how they reward us to come to cast us out of thy possession. The same thing the Roman Catholic Church is trying to do is throw Israel out of Jerusalem. Exactly, the history is being repeated. O oh, our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have not no might against this great company that cometh against us, neither know we what to do, but our eyes are oh, upon thee. And all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, with their wives and their children. The same Israel will do in this day today. All of them will come together. And they will mourn and weep even as Zechariah, Zechariah the prophet says in chapter 12. And upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah. That's interesting. Zechariah prophesies of it. Now the son of Zechariah comes and, and, and prophesies as well. The son of Beniah, the son of Je, Je, uh, Yoel, the son of uh, Mataniah, and the Levite, of the sons of Asaph, came the spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. I mean, if that's not like a case of Joel 2.38, I don't know what it is. And he said, Hearken ye all Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. Tell me this is not a precursor of the Armageddon battle, for example. This battle is not, does not belong to Israel. God will bring vengeance himself against his enemies. Tomorrow go you down against them. Behold, they come up in the cleft of Ziz, and you shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of, of Ural. You shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand this battle, set yourselves, uh, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, for they did, or did, be, excuse me, be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah the, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshiping the Lord, and the Levites, the children of the Korhites, and of the children of the uh, Korhites, stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a loud voice on high. And they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe his prophets, so shall you pr prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord, and that they should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army, before the army, See, and they, and they, oh, praise the Lord. All right, and, and when they began to sing and to praise the Lord, set an ant, well, in, in, in your King James, it says an ambush against the children. Uh, the children. That's actually liars in wait. So what does he do to the, to the Ammonites and the Moabites? He puts all kinds of liars in there to bring about an accusation against who? Mount Seir. Hmm which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. 
They were, in other words, they were struck. They believed this lie. They believed this rumor, this ambush. All right? And what do they do? But the children of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, utterly to slay and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, everyone helped to destroy another. Then they turned on each other. Okay, okay. You guys have got to see this one. In. All right, hang on. Let me take you to Revelation 17, 6. In the Christian Bible, rabbis, you got to listen to this. This is interesting. This is exactly what's prophesied against the Vatican. Uh, 17, 16, verse 16. All right. Let's back up to verse 13. These have one mind, shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Just like the Ammonites and the, uh, uh, the ones here, they gave their power to, to Mount Seir to come up against Israel. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them for... He is the Lord's, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, and they that are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. And he shall uh, saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. These are the Amorites and all those with Mount Seir that come up against Israel. Okay? For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree, and to give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words uh, of until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is... Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm sorry, back up. I'm, I skipped, uh, I read too quick. Uh, verse 15, And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For the God hath put it in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. See, even in the book that John wrote called Revelation, they turn against Mount Seir, just like the Ammonites do here. And then they turn against each other and kill each other off. So Israel, this is not your battle. This is God's. And every one there, Shimon Perez, Prime Minister Netanyahu, the people, the poor of Israel, the down and out, the Levites that are there today, the children that are there, you're only playing out a part. Be faithful to God, and he'll be faithful to you. God bless you.